Shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's gonna take my name. Both parents um, were really owned by alcoholism and drug addiction. What I resented them for, I, as in a teenager, I grew right into it myself. Got really bad to the point my, my wife left. I was so blind and it was so broken. I couldn't take the pain anymore. And it was either was I was gonna pick something up again, drugs or alcohol, or I was gonna hurt somebody or I was gonna hurt myself. That I wound up crying myself to sleep and just, all I said was, God help. We were really struggling in our marriage and you know, we weren't aware of really how bad it was until we ended up separated. And I was really far from God at that time. I felt lost, I felt alone a lot. I didn't know how to fix it. I was super prideful on work. When something got tough with our marriage, I went to work. It was three days before my birthday. Morse gave me the words of, we're getting separated. I was crushed. One thing I thought was marriage would always be there. They felt it being tore away from me. Love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. There ain't no grave gonna hold. When I hear that trumpet sound I'm gonna rise up out of the ground There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down Fear is a life With smooth and velvet tongue Trumpet sound, love is my weapon. I'm gonna take my giants down. There ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. There ain't no. There came a night here shortly after that, and the next day when I woke up, I had the willingness to ask for help. My mom lived in Florida at the time. She came home. She shows up at my door, and she said, I'm just here to help. One of the biggest males I've seen God do in my life. I watched her become a, a woman of grace, and she believed that God was the solution. You know, and for me, guys in AA, they got this one really cool step, which says, you came to believe that God restored your sanity. And I don't know that I'd be sitting here if I didn't believe that. I wound up having stage four cancer, I had tongue cancer. It was new in, in Christian faith. I was going to church, I was very involved, believed in God, believed in Jesus, was moving forward, and then this happens. And the thing that really went right to my head was, okay, it's stage four, you know, there's a chance I could die here. And I will tell you that there were not one, not two, dozens of times where God was like, he showed up, and he, he didn't just show up, he showed off. And I gotta tell you, I had one round of chemo, I had one round of radiation, and that's it. And they sent me on my way and said, you're good to go. Just look back at that, six years ago, my life is so different today. I, I walk around like there's nothing wrong today. Slowly throughout that 10 month period, I could feel the Holy Spirit really talking to me and telling me, this is what God wants for you. You need to keep working on your marriage and you need to, to try and not give up.
It allowed me to have my time to work through it and to focus all my energy on what I wanted. And I think that's when I really was able to have my heart and my mind open to what God was telling me. I started feeling hope. I just felt loved by God and like always, He pulled through and brought us out on the other side stronger than we ever were. Instead of totally blaming Morris for any of it, I looked at what I could change. Did counseling, I read for hours, dug into scripture, and eventually I could see where God was working. There's always good happening if we choose to see it. God's always doing good stuff. We can work together now, and now we do it with God leading us, because it definitely didn't work without Him. There was a battle, a war between death and life, and there on a tree, the Lamb of God was crucified. He went on down to hell. Don't you just love hearing stories about people whose lives have been forever changed through an encounter with Jesus Christ? I mean, that's what Easter is all about. We have hope through his redemption story. Welcome to CEFC Anywhere. We're really glad you chose to join us here this morning. My name is Bill. I'm an elder here at CEFC, and I'm just pleased to welcome you. Uh, wherever you are, we'd love to connect. So please use the comments section of whatever app you're watching us on to let us know who you are, where you're watching from. And if you need prayer, please feel free to let us know. We have a whole community of people that would love to pray for you. But right now, we'd invite you to sit back, go full screen, crank the music up through whatever stereo system you may have, and join us as we celebrate an empty tomb. Displayed for us Oh God, we thank you for the cross Lifted up on Calvary's hill We curse your name And even still You bore our shame and pay the cost oh god we thank you for the cross let's sing it out from wherever you are this morning behold the lamb the story of redemption written all his hands jesus you will reign forevermore the victory We sing your praise, endless hallelujahs to your holy name. Jesus. 
Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Offer up this sacrifice for every sin. Our Savior died. The Lord of life can't be contained. Reason from the grave. Yes, our God has risen from the grave. Behold the land, the story of redemption is in His head. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. The King of Kings, oh God, forever we will sing. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. Keeper, 
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Working. We make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. darkness my god that is who you are oh that is who you are 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 Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Isn't it amazing to know that God will always make a way for us. You know, the time we find ourselves in right now, you may feel as if hope is in short supply. But isn't it comforting to know that God is and forever will be our way maker? 
Those of you that have continued to give to us over these recent weeks, we are so thankful. We're overwhelmed by the generosity you have displayed in coming alongside of us in continuing to support our vision and our mission to help people take their next step closer to Jesus. At the bottom of your screen, you'll notice some ways in which you can give right now. But if you're checking us out for the first time, we want to make sure you know we have no expectation for you to give. This is just an opportunity for those of you that call CEFC your church home to join us in that vision and that mission. Right now, we're going to hear a word from Pastor Brian. And if you find yourself having a hard time finding hope in the situation that you're in, lean in. We think we've got something special for you today. and happy Easter. And I just want to say that in these unprecedented and really troubling times, it's just great to be able to have a constant to which we can turn in this moment. And that's really what Easter is all about. Easter is about us remembering and celebrating the reality that Jesus did not stay dead, that he is alive right now, reigning at the right hand of the Father, and that's the constant that we can turn to no matter what's going on in our lives. And so I would just encourage you that, that even though my heart hurts a little bit, that we're not able to celebrate that reality together in a room the way that we normally would, I would just encourage you to lean on that constant and to use today to celebrate and reflect on the reality of who Jesus is and what he has done. And what I'd really like to do today is I'd just like to spend some time talking with us about why what Jesus did matters in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Because what's really interesting about this time going on with the coronavirus is that it's brought a certain level of commonality to all of us. Where it seems like no matter who you are, we have actors like Tom Hanks or the Prime Minister of Britain who, if you're not familiar with British politics, would be like our president who are getting infected with this virus. It seems like the playing field has been leveled, so to speak. And what's so interesting about that is that because of the playing field being leveled, we find ourselves in a place where a lot of us are being asked the same questions and having the same things revealed to us in that time. And one of those things I think that's coming to the surface and being revealed are the things that we really value and are really important to us in life. And so maybe over the last several weeks, you've learned just how important health and safety are to you, where you've done everything that you possibly can to avoid getting this virus and to protect your loved ones. Maybe you're learning just how important freedom and comfort are because you can't do what you want when you want to do it. Maybe you're learning just how important sports are to you where we're having to resort to watching different sporting events from the last 20 years. I kid you not, the other day I watched a game from five years ago that I knew exactly what was going to happen, when it was going to happen, and I did that because there was nothing good on TV, there was nothing worth binging on Netflix, and I just wanted a little bit of a taste of normalcy back in my life. And so I think what's going on right now is that we're being faced with this reality that, that this time we're in is asking us the question and beginning to reveal to us the things that are the most important in our lives. 
where we're beginning to see those things that belong in a category of being in f- of first importance. And I think one of the questions that Easter begs us to ask ourselves is whether or not we've made what's of first importance what really should be in our lives. Because there is something that should be of first importance to us that a lot of times we don't even realize or we don't give that level of importance that it deserves. We see this in a passage in the Bible that's written to a church in a place called Corinth, and it's written by a man by the name of Paul. And we read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. It says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one Ab normally born. There is one simple question that I would like you to ask yourself this morning as we go along and we talk together, and it's simply this. What has this season shown you is of first importance in your life? What has this season revealed to you belongs in the category of the most important things in your life? See, there's a lot of important things going on in that passage that we just talked about. But what I'd like us to focus on is the reality that Paul looks at the Corinthians and he says, When I came to you, I shared with you what I received and I gave you what was of first importance. And it's really interesting to consider what he doesn't say next. You see, at the time that Paul was writing this letter, there was a massive famine going on in the world where food shortages and starvation were beginning to become the norm of what they were facing. They, they were facing going, something going on in their world that was disrupting their natural way of life, so much so that Paul, earlier in this letter, gives counsel that if the Corinthians find themselves single, it would be a good thing for them to stay that way at least until this famine has passed. And while that's a little bit different than what we're facing right now, it's sort of similar at the same time. And so what's fascinating about this passage is that what Paul passes on to the Corinthians of first importance is not how they can be healthy and safe during this famine. It's not the best way for them to find food, and it's not the best way for them to stay fed. He he doesn't pass on to them the moral code that they should be following. He doesn't give them the ideology that they should adopt as people in their minds. He doesn't give them all the theologically correct answers to different tertiary issues. He doesn't even give all the answers to the greatest ethical and philosophical problems that he has. What does he say instead? Like, like he doesn't bring up all of these things that we would think of be, would be of first importance. What he says is of first importance is Jesus and his work on the cross. Where the most important thing that Paul could give to the Corinthians was the reality of Jesus' death and resurrection and what it accomplished for us. He goes on to explain this when he says that what's of first importance is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And what he means by this is that there's something wrong with us. There's something wrong with our world. And I think that's something to which every single one of us can relate where there's just this feeling inside of us that things aren't the way that they're supposed to be. And that feeling is so prevalent right now because things like death and sickness have a way of bringing that angst out of us in ways that other things don't. Where the pain and the struggle and the difficulty that come with death and sickness bring about this feeling that just seems to be innate in us where we just feel like things aren't right. Things aren't the way that they're supposed to be. And the reason that we have that feeling is because that's true. Is because things aren't the way that they're supposed to be. See, God created a perfect world devoid of death and sickness and famine and struggle. And then he created us as the pinnacle of that creation. 
And God created us as people in his image where our job was to reflect God's image to the rest of his creation and then reflect the worship of God's creation back to him. We were created to be in intimate relationship with God. We were created by God for God to live with him and reign with him until we introduced sin into the world. Despite the fact that we were created to have a relationship with God, we wanted to be God. We wanted to be the ones calling the shots. We wanted to be the ones determining who we were going to be and what we were going to do with our lives. And because of that innate desire in us called sin, every single one of us rebel against God and fall from the relationship with him for which we were created. And because of that rebellion and that fall, our relationship with God is broken beyond anything that we can do to repair it. And because of that broken relationship, sin enters the cosmos and fractures absolutely everything so that the world you and I experience and the life that you and I experience is not what it was supposed to be. In fact, we are so broken that Paul writes in one of his other letters that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. That we're so broken that we're dead and we can do nothing to fix this brokenness and this struggle that exists in our lives and in our world. And that's why that statement, Christ died for our sins, is so important. Because Jesus Christ came to this earth as the one to whom the entire first half of the Bible called the Old Testament, which was written long before Jesus showed up, and he's the one to whom all of that points where over and over again, time and time again, God was looking at his people and saying, I am going to send someone to make things right. I'm going to send someone to fix the brokenness that exists between you and I and exists in our world. And that someone was Jesus Christ who came to this earth, not just as a human being, but as God in human form. So much so that one of his closest followers by the name of John says that though no one has ever seen God, God has made himself fully known in Jesus Christ. That when we look at Jesus, we're seeing God. We're seeing an exact representation of who God is. And what Jesus came to this earth to do is to live the human life we were all meant to live in intimate relationship with and devotion to God and to take that life as a perfect sacrifice to the cross where he would die the death that every single one of us were meant to die. You see, our brokenness, our sinfulness, and our rebellion against God sees us stand rightly condemned before him, where every single one of us are worthy of having God pour out his wrath and his judgment on us in a state that could only be described as pure hell. And what Jesus came to this earth to do was to die on the cross for that sin so that he could take that punishment we deserved on himself so that we wouldn't have to. What's of first importance is that we would believe in Jesus and the fact that he died on the cross as a substitute for us and our sins according to the scriptures. But that's not all. Paul says that that Christ died for our sins. And then in verse 4, he says that he was buried, which is a little bit of a strange statement to make because that's what naturally happens to dead people. But, But Paul's trying to make a point here that Jesus actually died. That Jesus' heart actually stopped beating, that his lungs actually stopped breathing, and that his brain actually stopped functioning. Jesus didn't just faint while he was on the cross and then wake up after they took him down. It wasn't this princess bride moment where he was mostly dead and then recovered later on. No, Jesus was actually dead and buried in a tomb for all of Friday night, all day Saturday until Sunday morning when Paul says that Jesus was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. So Jesus actually died on the cross for our sin, was buried in the grave, but rose again on the third day, which was Sunday, as we celebrate today that Jesus was raised from the dead. What's of first importance is that Jesus did not stay dead. He's not dead anymore. He's alive because he rose himself from the grave and walked out of the tomb in which 
he was buried. And what Paul is trying to get across here is that the one thing that is of first importance in our lives is that Jesus actually died, was buried, and rose again. And the question that Easter Easter begs us to ask is why is that so important? Why is it so important that this message that Jesus died on the cross for our sin was buried and raised again? Why is that so important? And Paul answers this question in our passage when he writes that after Jesus was raised, he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What Paul is trying to get across is that the reason Easter is so important, quite simply, is because it actually happened. The Easter story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection actually happened. We do not believe in a myth. We do not believe in a fairy tale. We do not believe in some story that we tell our children in order to make them fall asleep at night. We believe in a historical event that actually happened. And what Paul does is he tries to lay out for us some evidence that Jesus didn't in perception, raised from the grave, he actually did. And he says that after Jesus rose from the grave, he appeared to a guy by the name of Cephas. And Cephas is better known as the apostle Peter. And then after he appeared to Peter, he also appeared to the other 11 of Jesus' closest followers. Now, that would be something easy for those guys to make up, right? Like these 12 guys just wasted the last three years of their life, it seems, following after a man every waking moment of every day because they thought he was special and now he's dead. And so in order to redeem themselves a little bit, they come up with this story that Jesus isn't actually dead and he rose from the grave and he's walking around. It would be really easy for 12 people to come up with that. Only Paul says that after Jesus appeared to Peter... And the other apostles, he appeared to 500 people at one time. Mass hallucinations don't happen on that scale. And then he goes a little bit further where Paul says that these 500 people aren't just a figment of your imagination. Most of them are still alive today and you can go ask them about what they saw if you want to know that for yourself. See, if they were trying to make something up, you don't look at a group of people and say, there are 500 people who saw this, hundreds of whom are still alive and I have all their addresses so you can go talk to them about what they've seen and what they've experienced for yourself. And then he doubles down on this a little bit more. And what's interesting about this is not just to see the people that Paul mentions that Jesus appeared to, but to see the people he doesn't mention as well. Where we have four accounts of Jesus' life written by guys named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And all of them tell the story about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And in every single one of those accounts, the first people to whom Jesus appeared after his resurrection are women. This is so important because in Greco-Roman and Jewish culture, women were considered second-rate people who were so untrustworthy that their testimony wasn't permitted into a court of law. And so if you were making up a story, one of the worst things that you could do to make your case is to have the first people to whom Jesus appeared alive be people who were perceived as so untrustworthy that they couldn't even testify about a crime that they had witnessed. And then Paul goes even further where he says that not only did Jesus appear to 500 people, hundreds of whom who are still alive, he also appeared to a guy by the name of James. Now, James is an interesting character because James is the brother of Jesus. James grew up with Jesus. He watched Jesus live. He watched Jesus do his ministry. And James didn't buy into what Jesus was selling at all. In fact, at one point, you find out that not only did James not buy into it, but his whole family didn't buy into it because James and all of his family go to try and bring Jesus home because they think he's lost his mind. 
You fast forward about 10, 20 years or so from that moment, and we find James, the brother of Jesus, writing a letter to a group of churches in modern-day Turkey, and here's how he starts the letter. From James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have any brothers, but I do have two sisters, and when I read this, my brain kind of explodes a little bit because when I think about my two sisters, I cannot dream up a scenario where I would look at either of them and call them Lord or equate them with God unless they did something so undeniable that I had no choice but to do that. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, how in the world did James go from thinking that his brother was insane to calling him a Lord and equating him with God? Well, because James saw his brother die and live again. James went from calling his brother a lunatic to calling him Lord because he saw his brother die and come back to life. And then Paul just kind of adds a cherry on top of the Sunday, so to speak, where he says that last of all, Jesus appeared to him personally. And the reason that's so important is because Paul absolutely hated Jesus. Hated Jesus so much that he made it his life's mission to travel around and round up any people who called themselves Christians, men, women, children, didn't matter, he was indiscriminate. He would round them all up, put them on trial, make sure they got thrown in prison and had some of them executed. Where Paul's life mission motivated by his hatred for this claim that Jesus had raised from the dead was to round up hundreds if not thousands of Christians and throw them in prison and make sure that some of them were executed for it only for Paul to undergo such a radical change that he became one of the most greatest proponents of Christianity that's ever walked the face of the earth, planted hundreds of churches and led thousands of people to believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. How in the world does someone go from hating something so much to being such a devout follower of that person? Well, one day, Paul was on his way to a city in order to continue his mission of rounding up, putting on trial, imprisoning, and killing Christians. And he encountered the risen Lord Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father for himself, and his life was never the same afterwards. And by the way, these three people that Paul mentions here, Peter, James, and himself, would all go on to die because they refused to deny the fact that Jesus had raised from the grave. My friends, you don't do something like that for a fairy tale or a story that someone made up. This happens because Jesus predicted his own death and resurrection and actually pulled it off. You see, the question that Easter asks us isn't, did Jesus actually do what he said he did? The question that Easter asks every single one of us is, what are you going to do with the reality that Jesus died for your sin, was buried, and raised back to life? My encouragement for you is that you would do the exact thing that Paul did, that James did, that Peter did, that Paul outlines for us in the first verse of 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stands. When the Corinthians heard this message that we just talked about, the only response that they could have was to receive it. Like when you finally realize that Jesus actually predicted his own death and resurrection and pulled it off, the only appropriate response that we can have is to receive that truth and believe it for ourselves. In fact, that word received can actually be translated take. 
where the only appropriate response, the one that God accepts for the forgiveness of our sins is to take the truth that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin and rose again on the third day and receive it and trust it and completely devote and commit our lives to it. And I want you to know that if you have never done that before, that's something that you can do right now wherever you find yourself. It doesn't matter where you're watching this. You have the opportunity to receive the truth and believe in the reality that Jesus died for you and rose again three days later. You can receive that by going to Jesus and saying, Lord Jesus, I am so thankful for what you have done for me on the cross. I believe in it. I trust in you because of it. And I surrender my life to you in love and devotion out of appreciation for the massive amount of love that you have shown to me for what you've done on the cross. It's that simple. You are one step away from a relationship with the God of the universe and that step is believing in and submitting to Jesus as your Savior and Lord because he predicted his own death and resurrection and actually pulled it off. Now if you have done that, if you've taken that step in your life, can I just ask you, is Jesus really of first importance in your life? Is Jesus and what he's done for you the thing that's the most important part of your life and your existence? Is he more important to you than anything else? Because what we see in our passage is that the more importance we give to Jesus, the more we experience the second thing that makes Easter so important. And so Easter is important because it actually happened. And the second reason that it's so important is because it gives us hope. One of the things I find interesting about us as Christians is how much we tend to focus on and talk about the death of Jesus. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because earlier in this same letter to the Corinthians, Paul looks at them and says, when I was with you, I wanted to make known nothing other than Jesus and the reality that he was crucified. But we cannot forget the simple reality that if Jesus doesn't raise from the dead, his death means nothing. If Jesus didn't come back to life, then his death is fruitless and it's meaningless. That's not my idea, that's Paul's. He goes on to say this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 19. He says, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised either. And if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then our faith is just futile because we're still left with this problem of our sin that we cannot fix. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then all of our loved ones who've died are lost. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then we are left with a hopeless existence and a hopeless life. Allow me to explain what I mean. It is widely believed, accepted, and taught that one day our world is going to end when the sun goes the way of every other star in our universe and burns out. And what's either going to happen is that either we will be burned up in our sun going out or everything will freeze to death when the sun stops burning and it stops shining. And if that's true, if that's the case, then nothing that we do actually matters. No amount of advancement that we gain, no amount of progress that we make, no technological or medical inventions or cures, none of it ultimately matters because all of it will either be burned up or frozen in the end. I don't know about you, but that is a hopeless thought. That's a hopeless existence and that's what we're left with if Easter isn't true. A godless universe where we're left with a life that we might be able to have some fun while we're here and maybe accomplish things, but ultimately, none of it matters in the end. And that's what Paul is getting at. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, this hopeless reality is that which we're left with. 
And what's great is that he doesn't stop at verse 19. He goes on to verse 20 and he says this, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This verse means that we have a hope to which we can cling in any circumstances and the hope is wrapped up in what this phrase, the first fruits of the dead, actually means. You see, what it doesn't mean is that Jesus was the first one to ever come back from the dead. There are several people in the Bible where there are stories of them being raised back to life before Jesus actually did that. And we actually experience something that's a similar to what happened here and what we're talking about, where we have people who are clinically dead, whose hearts stop beating and brains stop breathing, that are brought back to life through the miracle of modern medicine and their lungs start breathing again and their hearts start beating again. One of the most crazy scenarios of this that we've ever seen happened in 1999 where a Swedish radiologist was out skiing. Her name was Anna Bogenholm and when she was skiing, she got trapped under some ice in a river that she fell into for 80 minutes. She was able to stay alive and conscious for the first about 40 minutes or so because she found a pocket of air to breathe while she was under the ice. But after 40 minutes, she went into cardiac arrest. But amazingly, what happens after 80 minutes of being stuck under ice, they actually got her heart beating again and her lungs breathing again, and she made a full recovery. And while those stories are great, while it's great to think about the reality that we are able to bring people back from death's door, the simple reality is that when we do, we bring them back into a life that will still end in death. Death may not have gotten them the first time, but it will get them eventually, just like it will every single one of us, except for Jesus. See, what that passage means is that when Jesus was resurrected, he was resurrected into a life that would never end in death again. He was resurrected into an existence where he would never have to taste death for all of eternity. See, through Jesus' death and resurrection, he waged war against sin and death, and he won. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus fought and won the battle with sin and death and the forces of darkness that we cannot possibly win ourselves. And what's absolutely mind-blowing is that Jesus gives us credit through belief in him for that victory and allows us to share in the spoils of that victory. 1 Corinthians 15 ends with one of the most beautiful passages in all of the scriptures where it says this, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The hope that Jesus gives us is that one day we will be resurrected just like he was into the victory that he won for us. That one day we'll be resurrected into life with Jesus and be given victory over sin and over death and over the powers of darkness and sickness and famine and war. All of these things will dissipate and finally be gone when King Jesus assumes his throne on earth the way that he already has in heaven. You and I, through belief in Jesus, get the hope of the assurance that comes from knowing that that will be our shared experience through him. And there is no pandemic or and no economic fallout, no quarantine, and no reality that can possibly take that away from us. Jesus has won the victory. He has given us the hope that one day, just like he was, we will be resurrected into a reality devoid of all the struggle that we experience in this world as we experience the victory that he won for us. And it's because of that that Paul wraps up 1 Corinthians 15 with these words. And I just want you to hear these words as if he was saying them to you and I in the room with us where he writes, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand Firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work 
of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Jesus deserves to be of first importance in our lives because he actually died, was buried, and raised back to life, according to the scriptures. This, this isn't a fairy tale we believe in. It's something that actually happened. And because of that, we have the hope that the victory Jesus won through his work on the cross and his resurrection will be ours one day through belief in him. And so my encouragement to every single one of you this Easter is to stand firm in that reality. Do not be moved from it. Stand firm in the reality that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. See, my my concern is that there are so many things in the world right now that can take us away from Jesus. There are so many things that, that can cause so many other things to become of first importance in our lives other than Jesus. But no matter what you're facing, no matter whether you're facing COVID-19 or economic disaster or relational discord, you have the hope that Jesus has won the victory over those things and that every single one of them is temporary. This virus will end. The economic struggle from it will end. Every struggle that we have in our lives will end when we are resurrected into the victory that Jesus has won for us. So keep working for the Lord. Keep being everything that Jesus has called you to be. Keep doing what he's called you to do because you know that there's a point You know that it's worth something. You know that that's your purpose in life. Keep encountering Jesus through prayer and through community and through reading the scriptures that tell us all of these things. Stand firm and do not be moved from the fact that Jesus actually died, actually was buried, and actually rose from the dead on the third day. And that through that work, he's won the victory over sin and death that someday you and I will get to experience when we meet him face to face. And so I'm going to ask you to do something, and it might be a little weird if you haven't been doing this so far, but I'm going to ask you to either stand up or or to turn up the volume on your TV or device. Do whatever you need to do in order to engage with us as we sing a song that declares this reality that we've been talking about. Afterwards, Pastor Phil is going to give us some thoughts that you won't want to miss. And so as you prepare to engage with us, as we declare the reality that Jesus has given us hope by dying and raising again, let me pray for us. Father, I thank you so much for the certainty and the reality that comes with the fact that you sent your son to this earth to die for our sins. Lord Jesus, I praise you so much for the fact that you did that work, that you actually died that you were actually buried and that you actually rose again from the grave. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would lead us into a fuller belief in that reality than we've ever had in our lives. I pray for anyone listening that has not taken that step to believe in what you've done for them, that you would move them into that, that you would grab hold of their heart and draw them into a relationship with you through believing in what you've done for them. I pray for all my brothers and sisters who have taken the step of believing in who you are. Holy Spirit, lead them into a fuller relationship with you. Show them where they're not making Jesus of first importance in their lives and allow them to insert him into that place that he deserves to be for the work that he's done. And Jesus, I just praise you And thank you so much for the hope that you provide for us. That one day we will see you face to face. And that when we do, we will experience the victory that you won for us. When you overcame death and walked out of the grave for all eternity. It's in your name that I pray these things. Amen. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven 
and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory My name is Phil. I'm one of the preaching pastors here at CFC. And as we just heard from Pastor Brian, that there is a hope that exists for all of us, a hope that is guaranteed, uh, a hope that is true, that because Jesus not only died and rose again, he offers us an opportunity to remove the sting of, of sin and remove the sting of death and to have life ourselves. You know, I was reading recently in the final week of Jesus' life, right before he was about to go to that cross, and right before he was going to walk out of that tomb, uh, Jesus told a story. And the story is about a king who was having a banquet. And at the banquet, he invited all kinds of guests, friends and family members. And he sent his servants out to go find those guests. And they, one after one, rejected the invitation. 
um, they were too busy or they didn't care, they were unconcerned, they had better things to do. And so the king sent servants to invite anybody to go into the, the back alleys, to go into the fields, to go wherever they had to go to invite. And what struck me was this, this idea that as I grew up, I was so often given this impression that I was the one doing the inviting. I was given the impression that I had to invite Jesus into my life, or as it was often said, invite Jesus into your heart. And what I realized is that it is Jesus who invites us. Jesus has invited us into a relationship with Him and through that relationship to have restored relationship with the Father, to come to the feast which will be in the kingdom of God. And to me, that's far more powerful for me to understand that there's an invitation that came from God in heaven rather than to think that I invited Him and I have to hope that somehow the God of the universe will respond to my invitation to know that the God of the universe has invited me and wants me as a guest in his kingdom. Guys, I want you to know that that invitation exists for you. Maybe this morning you heard something that you've never heard before from Pastor Brian. Maybe you never thought about the reality of Christ's death and resurrection. I want you to know that Jesus has invited you. And I ask you, what will you do with that invitation? Will you reject it? Will you be too busy? We say maybe later down the road, or will today be the day that you accept the invitation of God and through faith in Jesus Christ come to be with Him? I invite you just in a simple prayer, right where you are, whatever you're doing, wherever you find yourself, to say to God, God, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, that He died for my sins and that He came back to life to give me new life. I accept the invitation. And I choose to follow you. And I, I, I'm going to challenge you. If you made that, if you made that statement, if you prayed that prayer, if you've accepted that invitation, you are part of God's kingdom, a part of God's family. I encourage you to tell somebody. I encourage you to, in a chat group or through our Facebook, to let us know, so that we can take the next step in showing you what that looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. What that means. We just pray that this will be the greatest Easter in your life, that today would be the day that you accept the invitation of Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for joining us. We thank you so much for tuning in. We look forward to being together with you guys soon. Take care.